seated. Good morning, New Hope and wonderful church family. Good to see everybody here today. I see a lot of visitors and I want to say welcome. Good to have you today at our Easter service. I pray you're here for one reason today and that's to worship and praise and honor him who is worthy today because he's alive. Amen. You believe that this morning, church? He's alive. Praise God for that forevermore. Amen. I want you to get on your feet right now. We're going to do one that says, He lives. It's an old congregation song that everyone should know. Let's sing it this morning while they're taking up the offering. I serve a risen Savior. I know. praising you for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. Lord, we honor you today knowing that you didn't stay in that old grave. We know that you laid your life down to give us the opportunity of heaven. God, we, we praise you for that this morning, to know that you got up out of the grave. Oh, God, we think about all these other religions that's out in the world today and all of them's got somebody buried in a grave but <laughs> our king of kings and lord of lords is on the right hand side of the father today and we praise you for that this morning knowing and believing that you're alive and well dear god and you live in our hearts now god i pray for this service today for every family that's represented here today i pray blessings upon all of them God, if there's anybody here today that don't know you as their personal Savior, I know you've given Pastor Mel exactly what we need for the hour. And I pray that you touch those hearts and may they find their ways to this altar today and turn their life over to you. Lord, for the ones here today, and there's a bunch of us that's got junk in our life that we'd like to just get rid of, I pray today we can leave it here and walk out and just let you have it, Father. I pray that you move as only you can. Bless in the music this morning, dear God. And at the time of the adorning of the cross, Father, may it be a precious time for us to reflect on what you've done for us. And again, 
bless our pastor in your precious name this morning and amen you may be seated for me we got a brand new song for you and a brand new soloist tim you ready i'll take that as a yes i couldn't hear you all right let's go <laughs> where Jesus was laid for the sins of the world the lamb had been slain at Calvary death declared its final amen all creation trembled thinking this was the end See the light that's dawning on that third day. I can almost hear the Father say, Let the grave be open. Let the stone be moved. Let the someone here this morning as we prepare to worship him. Timmy.
in so everybody can find a place and if you don't have any room in your seat praise the Lord so all right just have a seat there okay let me uh, welcome you all wow this is great I can't believe you all came just to hear me preach this morning uh, So glad for you to be here today. Now we're going to do the uh, the flower thing and the cross this morning just a little bit different than what we've done in the past uh, because this is a time of worship. This is just as much a part of our worship as our offering and, and the choir and everything that we do. This is a, a worshipful time. And so in order to make it uh, a little bit easier for everybody, I've got a couple of guys standing in the back back there and we're going to start with the back rows, the last two rows. And they're going to dismiss you a couple of rows at a time so that we don't have everybody crowded up and you're not having to stand for the whole thing. And then you can worship along with us while you're waiting your turn because this is what it's about. It isn't just about flowers on a cross. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus Christ and celebrating his life and his resurrection. And uh, so, fellows, if you want to dismiss a couple of rows... Uh, Oh, yes, we want to dismiss the children and the kids for the junior church if you want to let them go. 
in the nursery. Um, that's why we have good folks behind me here to keep me on track. All right. All right, that's good. We don't need to talk. We're going to sing, and you can sing along with us. Is crowned with glory now. 
did it all for me. And after you counted the cost, you took my shame, my blame on my Yeah.
Amen. Isn't it pretty? Amen. And if you want to come up and get a picture after church the service this morning, you're more than welcome to do that. And uh, beautiful thing. I think it went really well, don't you? Amen. I like the idea. I give my wife credit for that. Uh, so open your Bible this morning to the book of John, please. John chapter 20. I, I love you adults, but I, I love to watch the kids. And uh, like, what's this going on? I don't know what this is all about. So, I want to read from John chapter 20 this morning. We'll begin in verse number one. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they both ran together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first. And he stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for each one that's come today on this blessed day. We have a lot to celebrate here. We celebrate your birth the Christmas season, and it is a wonderful thing. And we talk about your death, and without that, we have nothing. But the resurrection, the resurrection is the keystone of our faith. For if you did not rise from the dead, we have no hope. But we do have hope today, Lord, and we have the promise that your word gives us and I pray as we search your scriptures today, God, that your spirit will take this message and take this servant of yours and just speak through me today because there are folks here, Lord, that may not be here for a while and they need your message and I need your message. I need to be reminded that you're alive and that there is hope. I pray that you will have your will now and your way in this, this body of believers and we pray it in Jesus' name, and amen. I don't know if you folks are aware of this, but I'm pretty sure you are. This world is full of empty promises. We turn on our TV set, and there's more commercials now than there are programming, but, and the commercial comes on, and there's this real pretty smiling lady and she says if you have this kind of a problem we have this new thing a new medicine a new contraption a, a new thing and and if you would just for 1995 plus shipping wait but wait there's more we'll give you two of them your problems will all go away well, in case you haven't figured out, they're lying. The only thing that goes away is your money. And then you have to figure out what to do with both of those things that you can't use. The world is full of empty promises. People say, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Let's get married, okay? And we'll be just like Romeo and, no, I won't take Romeo and Juliet. That would be a very good one. I better, I better come up with a different one. 
We'll just live happily, whatever that other one is. We'll live happily forever after. Uh, empty promises again. Well, I got good news for you this morning. God's got some promises. And they're not empty promises. But they're based on empty things. And I want us to look at those empty things together for just a couple of minutes today. And I want us to see what God promises out of those empty things. The first one is that right there. You see, at Easter time, we forget about the cross. We focus on the tomb. We focus on Jesus. We focus on the hands. We focus on the disciples. We think about Mary. I went out with the teenagers this morning. I want them to see what it's like when they grow up. They weren't happy. Um, and I sat in there and they watched this film, Kyle Eidelman explaining the resurrection, and explaining the empty tomb, and, and showing what it was like for those disciples until they found out that Jesus was alive. We talk about that. But I want us to think about the cross for just a minute. If on that Sunday morning, if on that resurrection day, if we would take and leave that garden tomb for just a moment and leave the upper room where the disciples are meeting, if we would go back to Calvary, if we would go back to Golgotha, the place of the skull, what would we find there? I want to tell you what you'd find. You would find a cross still standing in the ground. And on that cross would be blood stains. And those stains would run down from that cross. They had changed. They're not bright like they were three days ago. They have turned dark and red and brown. And very likely on the ground around that cross would be the crown of thorns that had been placed upon Jesus' head. And if you picked that crown of thorns up and examined it, there would be stains, blood stains on those sharp prongs from that crown of thorns where they pressed it down upon his head. And surely, surely laying somewhere close by would be three nails. The crude spikes that they had forged and driven through his hands and his feet to hold him on the cross. And they too, they too would be stained with his blood. But guess what? The cross is empty. The cross is empty. What does it mean, you say? Why did he die? If he was so good, if he was so perfect, if he was so precious, if he was so God, why did he die? Because of you and because of me. It was my sins that put him on that cross and your sins that put him on that cross. The Bible says there is a debt to pay for our sins. Every time you lie, cha-ching, it goes in the debt column. Every time that you look at your neighbor's car and wish you had one, cha-ching, it goes in the column. Every time you take a snap when I'm preaching, cha-ching, 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 it goes in that column. Folks, our sin put Jesus on that cross. But listen to me this morning. Listen to me. The promise of the empty cross is forgiveness. That cross says that nobody, listen to me, nobody ever has to die for their sins again. Because that blood that stained that cross that blood that stained those nails, that blood that stained that crown of thorns, that was the blood of the precious, sinless, perfect, holy sacrifice for sin, the only one that could ever pay for sin, Jesus Christ. But what did you do with my sins? This is what it says in the book of Colossians. He took that sin, my sin, just as you say, well, you weren't even born yet. That's right, neither were you. But listen, he took the sins of all the world from eternity past till eternity future. 
And he took that list of sins, every one of them, all the negative things, all the nasty things, all the stuff that nobody else knows about except God, and he put them on a list, and he wrote them out, and he nailed them to the cross and paid for every one of them. People say to me, well, you know, I got saved one time, but I lost my salvation because I can't keep it. Nobody can keep it, folks. If we could have kept it, he didn't have to die. We got saved because Jesus paid for our sin. That's the promise this morning. You and I are forgiven because there's an empty cross. Praise the Lord. I watched that video this morning that those teens were watching out there. And, and I watched the, the en enactment of those disciples and I watched the face of Mary as Jesus died, those guys had hope. They, they believed. But what they were believing wasn't exactly right. I mean, they didn't understand everything then. Uh, they didn't get it all. Even Jesus' brothers, the ones, his half-brothers and sisters in their own household, they didn't understand it all. And when Jesus went to the cross and they watched him after hoping at him so much and they watched him stretch his arms out there and watched him nail him to his cross. What do we do? There was one scene that was so powerful that showed them all sitting around in the room before Mary shows up and, and they're all just hopeless. There's no hope. They had believed in him. They had trusted in him. They had left their families behind. They had left their jobs behind. They had walked away from their careers to follow Jesus. And they didn't know what to do. Did you listen to the story that we read there in John 20? I want to show you something. Our language, the English language, they tell me is a very tricky language. I don't know why. I've learned it very well. But our language is kind of limited. But the language of the scriptures, the language that the Bible was written in is very descriptive. And it uses unique words for different things. And there are at least three different words for the word see. When you see something, I see you. That doesn't tell you a whole lot. I may not see you particularly, but I see a group of people. Tim asked me earlier before we had the cross, he said, how in the world are we going to count all these people? I said, we'll just put on the board a bunch. <laughs> I mean, but I, I just, hey, look, look at these verses again that we read. I want you to see it and see what they saw there. It says that these two disciples, Peter and the man whom Jesus loved. Who was the man that Jesus loved? Do you know what his name was? John. That's the guy that wrote the scriptures here, that wrote this particular book of the Bible. Never refers to himself except as the guy who Jesus loved or the guy that's leaning on Jesus' breast, but he doesn't ever call his name. John is the younger of these two men, and probably he was the youngest of the disciples that Jesus called. And it says... That in verse 24, they went and ran together, and the other disciple, that's John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher, and he's stooping down, looking in. Now, this is the first word, and I want you to see this. This is good. This is the way that I look for things. Now, husbands, you'll appreciate this. I'll come out, and I'll say, honey, have you seen my... Fill it in. doesn't matter what it is. She said, did you look? <laughs> I looked. <laughs> mm -hmm. You guys understand, don't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> Go look again. It just means to look. It just means to look at something. Like I'm walking through a store and, you know, I'm looking and, you know, but I don't really see like you look at your watch and then somebody says, what time is it? Oh, I don't know. I just, what, I, I looked. This is what he did. He just looked. That's the first word. 
That was, that was John. But then Peter comes. And we have to know that Peter was the guy that ran inside, right? I mean, he has to be the one. And verse 6, and then cometh Simon Peter following him, and he went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloth, the napkin and all that stuff. This is the second word. He saw it, but he saw it. I mean, he really saw it. I say to my wife, honey, have you seen my so-and-so? No, did you look? Yep, I looked. Okay. I'm going to come look. Did you look? Honey, I went through that closet, and it is not there. And she walks in and puts her hand right on it. Oh, that makes me so mad. And you know what? After 45 years, it still works that way. I can't see any better than ever. To... Peter runs in, and he looks, and he sees the facts. He sees the napkin. He sees the grave clothes. He sees the body's gone. It's just an observation. He, he doesn't just see the whole thing. He sees the particulars, but it still hasn't come to the good part yet. And then it says that John comes in behind him. Then verse 8, Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw. And what? What did he do? Believed. He saw with understanding. You can see it, but not really see it. You can see it and know the facts, but then you can see and understand. These guys had no faith. Their faith was shattered. There is this tremendous tragedy, the death of the man that they had followed, that they had given up their life for, and they had followed him and taken and left everything behind, and their faith was shattered. They didn't know what to believe. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know what to do. But boy, when they went in that empty tomb and they saw those empty clothes, it promised faith. There was a reason to believe yesterday when we had our Easter egg hunt for our kids and, and our breakfast in here, and I had the, the kids, uh, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, third, fourth, I don't know what, there was a bunch of them. And, and I love talking to those kids because they're sharp. I mean, they're sharp. And I said, what was the significance of the grave clothes? And they began to tell me. You see, if somebody had stolen the body of Jesus, do you think they would have taken time to unwrap Yards and yards and yards and yards of material and 100 pounds of spices to get the body? No way. They'd have grabbed that body and taken off. But you know what? Those grave clothes were just exactly, just exactly, just exactly like they had put on Jesus, except he was gone. He just, psh, right through them. Right through him. And John looked, and he could see the form of a body there, but there wasn't any body. And he understood everything Jesus said you can believe. It gave birth to faith. In the tragedy, in the light of the cross, in the light of his his. Uh, arrest in the light of his torture, in the light of everything, in the rejection by the Jews, in the light of all of that, and him going to that cross and these men following afar off and watching as he hangs between heaven and earth, and all of that, and the dying, literally giving up the ghost on that cross, somehow faith died. But between the tragedy of Calvary and the triumph of Easter, they hung around. They didn't give up. They didn't all pack up and go home. They waited. And they went. And they looked. And the empty grave clothes said, you can believe because he's alive. I know in a crowd this size, I probably have no idea 
been preaching and pastoring for a long time, but I don't have any idea of the kind of tragedies that might be represented here today. And you may have trusted Jesus and you may have accepted him as your personal savior and believed in him and you used to walk with him and you used to be a part of a church fellowship and and you used to follow him and believe in him and trust him but this tragedy whatever it is has shaken your faith well on this Easter Sunday morning let me tell you something those empty clothes says he's alive and he still loves you and he's still in charge and he has an answer for you this morning You can trust him. Don't run. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't say, it's no use. Listen, God loves you. He's alive. The empty cross says, I can be forgiven. The empty clothes says, I can trust him. He did exactly what he said. On the third day, I will rise again. And he did. There's one more thing that was empty, and that's the thing that we all talk about on Easter. What is it? The empty empty tomb. The empty tomb. Wow. What about that? What's that got to say for us this morning? It has to say a lot. The empty tomb, listen to me, the empty tomb promises forever. Forever. Lazarus, the guy that donated the, the, the uh, or Nicodemus, the guy that donated the, the spices to wrap Jesus' body in back several years before when Jesus was involved in his earthly ministry, he was a leader of the Jews And he couldn't come to Jesus just outright and say, listen, I need to know more about what you believe. I want to know more about who you are. So he comes to him at night. And he said, Master, we believe that you are a man sent from God. How do I inherit eternal life? Jesus said, listen, here's what you got to do. You got to be born again. Born again? I'm a grown man. How can I enter again a second time in my mother's womb? Jesus, do you understand this? And he said, no, I understand it. You just don't understand it. He said, you have to be born a natural birth, and you need a spiritual birth. Every one of us in this room has had a natural birth. That's how we got here. We had some friends of ours had a, a baby this week. They had two precious little girls, and God blessed them with a little boy. Well, let me change that. A big boy, 10 pounds, 13 ounces. I think he was ready to drive a tractor the second day. I'm telling you. We all had to have a natural birth to get here. But we need a spiritual birth. The thing that stands in the way of that is the fact that we're dead. We're dead in our sins and our trespasses. We're alienated from God. I'm not dead. I'm alive. I'm I'm sharp. I got a good mind, a good job, a good family, a good home, plenty of money in the bank. What are you talking about being dead? Your problem is that dead means separated. You're separated from God. And you're separated by your sins. And although you are only spiritually dead, one day you're going to be physically dead. And that means you're going to be apart from God forever and ever and ever. But guess what? The empty tomb says that you don't have to be separated from God. The empty tomb says that you can be with God forever and ever and ever. Because he died, we died. And because he rose, we arose. And because he lives, we live. He told us, Mary and Martha, when their brother Lazarus died, he says, listen, even though a man would die, he will live. I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell my family. They're all sitting back there, but don't tell them, okay? A few years ago, um, 
through a variety of circumstances that are not important, my wife and I decided that we were going to get cemetery lots. My daughter's dad does morbid, Gary, morbid. And so we've got a marker on there. And, and uh, the other day, I just drove out and I walked up there and I looked at that. Guess what, folks? If Jesus doesn't come back, one day I'm going to die. But don't you mourn for this preacher because I'll be more alive than you are. I'll be alive. My back won't hurt. My headache will be gone. And I'll be alive. That's the promise of the empty tomb. We're going to be alive. What did he tell? What did he tell Nicodemus? He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, what's the next word? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what kind of life? Everlasting life. Jesus died once and he rose once and he will never die again and neither will those who put their faith in him. The woman at the well in Samaria, he says, give me some water. And she said, but you don't have anything to draw water with. He said, oh, I got a different kind of water. He said, I got a water that when you drink of that water, it wells up in time to you eternally. And you'll live forever with the Lord. You've got an empty cross that says that you can be forgiven of your sins. All of them, all of them. Somebody said, well, what about, I, 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 what, what, what am I going to do in the future, folks? When Jesus died, how many of your sins were in the future? All of them. He paid for all of them so that you can be forgiven, so that you can have a relationship with God. This stuff about salvation, so many times we make it so technical. We, we, you know, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to say this. And, and, and listen to me, please. Make, get this. If you don't get anything else this morning from this preacher, get this. It is a personal relationship with the eternal God. It isn't joining this church. It isn't being baptized in the water. It isn't saying some kind of prayer. It isn't signing a paper. It is a relationship with the eternal God through his son, Jesus Christ, who paid the way. It's a gift. You just got to receive it. You just receive him. And he says your sins will be forgiven. Well, preacher, you haven't been watching TV or reading the newspaper or been on the internet. This world's a mess. Yes, it is. And the only hope for this mess is Christ. Not the government, either party, not, you know, education, not the universities, not anything. The only answer, the only answer, the only answer that's ever been and the only answer that ever will be is Jesus Christ. And you can take that to the bank. And you can have hope today. You can have hope because your sins are forgiven. You can have hope because Jesus Christ is alive and well. You can have hope today because he has paid for your death and given you your life. But do you know him? In the bulletin today, Julie and I were talking, what do you want to put in there? I said, I want to put in that bulletin the tab that we usually put in there for visitors or prayer requests. I said, I want people to know Jesus. That's what I want. I want people to know Christ. I want you to have a relationship. I don't want this just to be a Sunday. I don't want this to be something religious. I want it to be something personal. I want you to know that you know him. You say, but my life, it doesn't matter what your life is. He's paid for that. He has an answer for that. He is the answer. But you've got to come to know him. You've got to trust him. You've got to say, Lord, here am I. Here's all my junk. Here's all my sin. Here's all my failures. Here's my mess. 
But more than anything, God, here's my sin. And he said, come on, I'll take it. I put it on my son, and he died for it, and that cross is empty. And you don't have to die for it, and you don't have to pay for it, because he paid for it for you. All you have to do is come and receive him by faith. We'd love to see you do that today. Let's pray. Oh, God, on this Easter Sunday, when so many folks are just going to church because it's Easter, and I'm thankful for every single person that's sitting in front of me today. I thank you for them. I thank you for the time they took to come here today to get ready to, to be a part of this service. But, God, my prayer, my desire, my heart for this church and these folks is do they know you? Not do they belong to new hope, not if they walk the aisle, not if they said a prayer, but do they know you? Do they know that your blood has cleansed them from their sin, that has covered their sin, that has promised them forever? Have they exercised that faith, that personal relationship faith, and accepted the free gift? If they haven't, God, it is my desire, it is my prayer, it is the burden of my heart today that they would just respond to your spirit now and just come and let us show them how they can know Jesus. Oh God, may it be so. You can only do it. I can't do it. I pray that you'll draw somebody here today to you. Maybe there's folks here, God, that knows you, but they've gotten away from you. And like those disciples, they've gotten discouraged and their faith has wavered. And I pray today the story of the resurrection, the events of Easter Sunday, I pray that it will restore their faith. It will cause them to look away from their tragedies and away from their troubles and look back to Jesus again and say, Jesus, I need your help. I need your hope. Help me to believe. I pray, God, that you'll have your way now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as best things. If you need to come today.